mic, so we we are good. All right. All right. So now that we have the recorder on, I'm going to give you the first program. The first program, I'm just going to call that you know decimal. I just call it decimal.c. Okay. There we go. All right. So it is going to have two parameters and one return value. The one return value is going to be an integer. It indicates the number of digits that it has parsed correctly as a base 10 you know, number. Um, the name of the subroutine is, I'll just call it parsed decimal, okay, parsed dec. And it will have two uh, parameters. The first one is a string. The second one is uh, a pointer to an integer. Int. Okay, there we go. All right. So I, I would first describe you know what it's actually doing. So this is going to uh, parse the string pointed to by str. The return value is the number of decimal digits actually processed. And um, p int points to an integer to store the value represented by the parsed string. Okay. Okay. Are there? So I, I will give you some examples of you know what what this means. Okay. All right. So I don't want to do anything with p int until I confirm that this is actually, you know, there's there are actually decimal you know, digits in it. Okay. So the best thing to do in this case is to use a while loop. But before I do a while loop, I'm going to use a counter. Okay. So I'll use a particular counter and initialize the counter to zero, just so that I can count the number of digits that I have, you know, uh, processed. Um, and the loop goes like this while str, whatever str points to, is less than the digit 9, and whatever str points to is greater than, oops, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, sorry about that. Well, since it's all getting recorded, you, know, you don't have to worry about typing it. Um, I think you guys should type it. Because I'm not doing a part of your, <laughs> you can you can just type it. You know, trust me, it's not complicated. Okay, it's not going to be a whole lot of typing. <laughs> and when you're doing it, you can also add your own bells and whistles to it instead of using my plain Jane vanilla type. You know, it's like tech. Come on, I mean, this is like bot. Okay, so as long as str is pointing to a digit, okay, because. If str, if whatever str points to is less than or equal to the ASCII code of nine, and greater than or equal to the ASCII code of zero, it is a digit, right? It's a digit from zero to nine. So I will just go ahead and do some processing here. What? Well, I, I'm going to assume that you have taken CISP 360. I cannot go back and re-explain C++ concepts. Okay. Because that's a decimal digit. Because a decimal digit. As long as I'm still looking at the decimal digit, I'll do the following. All right, so what I'm going to do is going to say, so this is going from left to right. So what I'll do is I'll say value is going to be the same as value times 10 because that's basically left shifting for base 10 okay plus um, whatever str points to minus the ascii code of zero so that means if i'm looking at the digit four i'll be subtracting the ascii code of the digit four excuse me i'll be subtracting the ascii code of zero from the ascii code of the digit four what do you think that value is without even looking up the ASCII table? 
What do you think? Four. It'll be four. Exactly. The value four, not the ASCII code four. So you got to make sure that you differentiate between the ASCII code as opposed to the actual value of four. Okay. Yep. So why we are using a constant charge? Like Sorry. So why we are using a constant charge? Because I don't want to accidentally change the string itself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the first thing I do. Uh, second thing I do is increment the counter itself, which is counting the number of decimal digits that I have processed. And then the third thing I'm going to do is to increment the pointer itself, so now I'm ready to process the next digit. Okay. Um, do I have to check for the null terminator explicitly? Nope, I don't have to because the null terminator has an ASCII code of zero. So by making sure it is within the range of the ASCII code of 0 and the ASCII code of 9, I have auto automatically checked for the null terminator. This will stop as long as soon as I hit something that is not a digit of you know, 0 to 9. Okay. Are there any questions about this code so far? No? Okay. So when I get out of this loop here, I'm going to say if counter is not 0, then I'll do some extra stuff. Because what I'll do is I'm going to change whatever p int points to to the value that I have just acquired. And then I'm going to return counter itself to let the caller know to, to let the caller know how many digits I have processed. That's it. That's the whole subroutine. So barring any stupid you know, syntax error that I might have made, this should be it. So I'm going to test it. So to test this subroutine, I'm going to put in a little main subroutine here. Um, and we'll just go ahead and uh, do a declare an integer x. <coughs> and, uh, I'll, I'll have two integers, okay, integer x and integer y. And I'll test it in, with several test cases. Can everybody still see it, or should I move the... Uh, Okay. The bottom up a little bit. People from the back, can you still, still, still see the screen? Okay. I'm just going to move it up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to say uh, y equals uh, parse decimal and then give it an actual string to process. Um, we'll just give it something simple. Okay, let's just call it zero here. And then we'll parse. We'll also give it the address of x because I do want to store the value into variable x. Y has the number of digits processed. X has the actual value represented by the digits that I have processed. Okay, and we'll just use a printf here and say um, not this number of digits processed. The value is you know another integer, okay. and the number of digits processed is y, and then the value is represented by x. There we go. Any questions about the, the first test case? So in the first test case, y should be 1, because I have processed one single digit. And x should be 0, because that is what that one single digit is representing as a value. Okay. Um, I'll give you the second test case. Second test case, we'll just try something that is not even a number. Okay. i is not a number. So in this case, um, it should return zero, which means you know I did not even process a single digit, and as a result, x should not even have changed, okay, um, because you know the code specifically check to make sure that I did process at least one base ten digit before it puts a value into whatever the pointer points to, which is the address of x in this case. Um, I'll give you something else, and this one is particularly important, okay. So we'll give it 007 and just good old 7. Okay. In fact, just to make it more fun, I'll give it 7 of 9. Yeah, movie references. Wakes everybody up. Except you guys are way too young to know who is 7 of 9, nor 007. <laughs> 007. 007. You can look up 7 of 9, you know, but I would do it, yeah. No. At home. <laughs> at home. <laughs> Alone. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll take a look at these two and figure out you know what it's going to return. Okay. Um, that's my entire program. Okay. So I have written the subroutine as well as some test code 
to check out the subroutine itself. Okay, and let's go ahead and try it out. Okay, so dash g dash c decimal dot c and the complaint. Oh, sure, I forgot to pound include something. Why? Go. Link it, dash O, decimal, decimal dot O. Just run it. There we go. So one digit is processed. The value is zero for the first case. That's correct. The second one, it did not process any digits, which is perfectly fine because, um, what did I give it to process? I. Oh, I, okay. So I is not even a digit, so it should not have processed anything. And it just does not even change whatever the pointer points to in that case. In the third one, I gave it 007. 007 is representing just the value 7 itself. And as a result, you know, the value is 7. And then the last one is 7 of 9. It processes 7, but since lowercase o is not a digit, it stops right there. So it processes exactly one digit, and the value represented by the processed digits is seven. Okay, now in your code, the return value is significant because if I give you 1.7 as opposed to 1.007, your program has to make a differentiation and process it accordingly. Does that make sense? The value 1.7 and the value 1.007 are different. When you look at the value, they are the same. But when you look at the number of digits that is used to represent that value, it's different. So you will have to somehow make use of that in order to work it out. Okay. Any questions about this little subroutine? Now, you don't have to, you know, test it too much because um, the worst I can give you is 9.9999. I will not give you like a really long string of zeros to nines, okay? To make sure that the integer of the decimal portion can always be contained in even a 32-bit number. So you don't have to think about, oh, but what if you give me 20 digits? You know, what do I do with, you know, the representation of something that's 20 digits in decimal. No, no, no. It's up to four, to four digits in decimal. Okay? So that really helps to simplify your code because you don't have to deal with the constant you know, shifting in base 10. You can do it all in, you know, all in one shot, basically. Okay? Any questions about this code? Okay, I'll give you another subroutine that you might find useful. Okay? And we'll just call that We'll just, I'll call it power two. Okay, there we go. And power two is going to do something like this. You give it an integer, uh, we call it x. And what it will return is um, the exponent of the smallest power of two that is greater than or equal to x. Okay. When you, when, you, when you look at the test cases, you will know what it does, okay? All right, so we'll just go ahead and say int i and int p, okay? p is the power itself. So what is um, to the power of zero? One. Okay, we'll start with one then. Okay, so what we're gonna do is to say, as long as the power of two, well, i has to start with zero, it's just a counter. So as long as the power of two is less than x, we are going to do something about it in the loop, okay? And what we're gonna do is simple. We just double p, because p is always a power of two, adding it to itself is doubling, okay? It's increasing the power. Um, and we also want to increase i, because i is a counter. You know, that's ultimately what I want to return. And that's the return value, return i here. So in this case, you know, what power two is going to do, you might need to do some tweaking with power two, okay, to fit your application, but it is going to be 
useful, you know, the, the basic logic is going to be useful, but you might need to tweak it. Like the less than, you might need to change it to less than or equal to, or add one to the result, or subtract one from the result. You have to figure out you know, what you need to do to tweak it. But what this is going to do is to um, quickly give you um, the exponent of the smallest power of 2 that is greater than or equal to a particular number. How do I know this subroutine is going to do it? If you just look at the condition on line six, that's right there. It's going to tell you what it's going to do. Because until p, which is always a power of two, is greater than or equal to x, what am I doing? I'm repeating it, right? And what do I do for each iteration? Going to the next power of two and increasing the counter, which is the exponent itself. Because i being 0 is the exponent of 2 when the power 2 to the power of 0 is 1. So that's the relationship between i and p. Is that OK? All right, so we'll test it with a few test cases just so that we know, you know, oh, OK, so I see what it's doing. <clears throat> because once you look at the actual, you know, code, um, you will probably find out, oh, OK, so it's not really that complicated. And we'll do uh, this one. I can just do a printf without any variables. So I will just say, you know, power to apply to 56 is percent d, and we just say power to 56 like that. And we'll give it a few test cases. Uh, we'll test one of the extreme cases, which is one. Um, we'll test 9999 which seems to have some kind of significance in your program. <laughs> and we'll test a zero would not work in this case, okay? So you do have special cases where you don't want to apply this. Um, zero actually does work, you know, but we'll, we'll just throw it in. So we'll go ahead, I should have written a subroutine to do this. Okay. All right. Yeah, zero will still work, you know, except um, one is greater than or equal to zero already, so it, it would just return a zero, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, test this one out. There we go. Does it make sense? Let's check. 2 to the power of 6 is 64. Is 64 the smallest power of 2 that is greater than or equal to 56? Yeah. Yep, because the next smaller one is 32, which is no longer greater than or equal to that number. 2 to the power of 0 is 1. Is 1 greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to 1? Yes. Is it the smallest power of 2 that is greater than or equal to 1? Yes. This is 14. Is 2 to the power of 14 um, the smallest power of 2 that is greater than or equal to 9999? Yeah. 14 is like 8,000. Right. Yeah, because. Uh, 2 to the power of 13 is 8192. So you need to bump it up at least one more time in order to be to, to catch a 9999. And this one is just a zero because one is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. All right. Yep. So for our homework assignment, it's, it's a power of two. For your homework assignment, you have to you basically have to read a string and convert the value represented by the string which is in base 10 into the double precision floating point number format which is natively represented in base 2. So the exponent is, it, is the base of the exponent on the 10 or 2? The number is it, is it 2. It is, it's, it's in, uh, in in the double precision representation, 
it is an exponent of 2. But remember, there's an offset of 10 to 23 too. So you might want to kind of bookmark uh, and refer to the wiki page, you know, particularly the, the one formula that we have been looking at today, because that really is telling you how to interpret the individual bits of a double precision uh, floating point number. But I'm just giving you the basic tools to help you go from base 10 to components of what you need to work with. Okay, okay so let's kind of think about this. What else do you think you will need in order to get this homework assignment done? Remember the bits are all over the place, right? We got three components. We got the sign bit, we have the bits representing the exponent, and then we have the fraction bits, right? So you so you have to kind of do the calculations, you know, kind of all okay, I'll I'll give you an idea. Use the uh, mouse pad. All right, so I can do this by hand first, okay? And you will have to kind of figure out how to do this using a program. Okay, I'm gonna just use a, a particular example here. I'll use one that is relatively convenient from one perspective. So I'm gonna use 1.25, because remember, I can only give you one digit on the left-hand side of the point, okay? So 1.25 e minus one, which is basically 0.125. <coughs> Do you think 0.125 can be exactly represented by a floating point number? It can, right? But you'll be surprised by what you know the bits actually involved in this case. Okay, so what do you do with 1.25e minus 1 as the input? Well, you try to parse this part as a decimal number, right? And this time, yes, it is a decimal number, and as expected, it only has one single digit. And then you um, you expect either a decimal point or e, right? Yeah. Okay, um, and you can use a conditional statement. You know, just uh, look at that one single character, branch it one way or another. It could be the null terminator too, but in this case, it's a period. Um, after that, you apply um, parse deck again. And this time it will tell you that I just parsed two digits and it's representing 25 as a value, right? Okay, so now you, at this point you have uh, the two components in base 10. You have 1.25. But since it's also telling you that it's using two digits to represent 25, you also know, you know what is supposed to be the uh, denominator, okay? It's 100 as a denominator. Because if I give you 1.025, then you have 1,000 as a, as a denominator. Is that okay? And that's why it's important to know how many digits are actually used to represent a particular value in base 10. Okay? So in this case, you know, I know this value is basically 1 plus 25 divided by 100. 100 comes from 2 to the power, excuse me, 10 to the power of 2. And the other part is, okay, now I you know, continue parsing, and it's a E instead of a null terminator, because the only alternative at this point, assuming the number is well formatted, is either a E or a null terminator, cannot be anything else, okay? And without having to do the error checking, your program is actually a lot simpler. If you have to do error checking, then everything needs to be double checked, and you need to have a way out of your code, and it gets a lot messier. But in this case, you know, assuming the number is correctly formatted, it can either be an E or a null terminator. Now that we know this is an E, we know that this has to be either a number or plus minus. This is a minus, and this has to be a decimal number. Okay? It can be 0 to 5, okay? because I gave you the restriction of the exponent in base 10 can only go up to 5 or negative 5. Is that okay? So after you parse this whole thing, you kind of know the value that it is representing is um, this. Now this carrot is really representing to the power of instead of, okay, fine, I'm gonna. No confusion here. 10 to the power of negative one, okay? But you cannot use power as a function because it is a math library. And I said, do not use any library calls, you know, do not call any other subroutines unless it is yours, right? Okay. 
What is the other way to do this? Keep track of the exponent individually. Okay, so this is a part of the actual exponent. This is the other part of the exponent. So keep track of that exponent in base 10 separately. Are we still doing okay? All right. In other words, what I'm saying is you can look at this number as 1, 2, 5, okay, divided by 100 times 10. That is the value represented by this number. Now, I'm breaking it intentionally into the components. The 100 comes from 10 to the power of 2. That 10 is coming from the exponent of negative 1. Is that okay? All right, so you have to track the exponent individually. Yep? What's the value of this? Is that B or? Say again? E. E? Yeah, what's the value? E is just a power. notation to say this is 2 times 10 to the power of. Yep? So it goes power 10 comma 2 is B125 e over 1. Say again? So it's power 10 comma 2 is B125 e divided by 1. Five by one. Um, no, you have the power on the other side then. Okay, let, let, okay, let me uh, change this to what you just mentioned, okay? Okay, so let's say you want to uh, do this instead, okay? So when you do this, then it is 1, point 1 plus 25 divided by 100. That part is not changed because you still have 1.25. But in this case, you know, it's multiplied by power 10 to because it's the, the exponent is representing 100, which is 10 to the power of 2. So the conversion is now saying this is 125. Um, right, because the, 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 one, the 100 is still there, okay, because the 100 comes from the 0.25, so the 100 is still here. But this power being a positive or non-negative power is going to apply to the other side. So you also have to multiply 100 on this side in this case. So this 100 is corresponding to the E2. This 100 is corresponding to the 0.25. Is that okay? So you need to keep track of, you know, you need to remember, you know, what is the sign of the exponent in base 10 so that you know which side to apply the um, exponent. Is that okay? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so now that you have this number in this particular format, what do you do? Okay, now in base two, it is, you know, we want to uh, keep going to the whiteboard. But in base two, you know, what we want to do is to represent the number as one point something, right? In base two, times two, or times power, two to the power of some exponent, I'll call this E2, okay, um, minus 1023. And this is the ultimate format that we want. So the question now is, how do I go from the base 10 representation, now that we have the individual components in base 10, how do we convert it into the base 2 representation? What do you think? Okay, first of all, first of all, if you just look at this portion, what is the range of value that we can possibly represent using this portion? Just looking at it, you should know kind of the range of value we can represent. It's from one to almost two, right? Because if all the question marks are ones, then this particular value is just the last number before two. Is that making any sense? Yes? No? Do you mean nines? Hmm? If, if nine. No, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, you're right. Okay. So that means, you know, when we have a number like this or a number like this, we want to either multiply it by 2 or divide it by 2 repeatedly 
until we get a number that is between, that's greater than or equal to one, but less than two. Is that making any sense? Okay. And that's your objective. Okay. That really is the most tricky part of this assignment, is how do we specify the logic so that we can adjust any quantity in this particular format, which can be a fractional, or it can be a larger number, okay? How do we turn something like this and turn it into um, a number that is between one and two? Greater than or equal to one, but less than two. The second subroutine that I gave you can go in one direction. You have to write another subroutine to go in kind of the opposite direction. Are we doing okay so far? Sound like a hmm? check greater than zero and less than two. In second subroutine, you check the greater than zero. All right. If we start with a situation like this, okay, then the number or the value that is actually represented is 125, right? If this is 125, then I want to be able to change it into a format that's more like this one. But at the same time, I have to count the number of times I'm dividing it by 2 because that becomes the actual exponent. But the exponent is the difference between E2 and 1023. So your job is to figure out what this quantity is going to be. And remember that E2 is already offset by 1023. Okay. On the other hand, if you have a format that's more like this, where the number is less than 1, then you have to multiply it by 2 until it fits the requirement of this one. And then every time you multiply it by 2, then you are increasing the exponent by 1. Yep. So you have to track all that stuff. But these two are distinct cases, so you have to understand you know, which case it is by looking at the decimal point or the number of places after decimal point and also the um, exponent. Um, you can keep track of both of those at the same time, but the bottom line is you want to turn it into this format while counting the number of times you have to multiply by 2 or divide it by 2. Is that okay? You can use division, multiplication, comparison, uh, bit shifting, uh, bitwise and a bitwise or, you know, with integers. Okay, so those are all going to be useful, especially division and multiplication. That's going to be useful. Okay, any questions? No. Yes. No. Kind of. Okay, I'll break this down into the actual individual components. Okay. So in base 10, you know, you can have a sign, which is plus and minus. That's an easy one. I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, you will have the first digit. Okay, so I'm going to say, you know, first uh, decimal digit. Okay. That's just from 0 to 9. Okay, guaranteed. Um, you will have potentially um, places or digits to the right hand side of the point in base 10. Okay, So you can potentially have a um, quantity to the right of decimal point. Uh, to the right of decimal point. Okay, You will also have the number of digits to represent a quantity, right? So you have number of digits to the quantity to the right hand side of decimal point. And last, you have the sign of the base 10 decimal exponent. And then you also have the decimal exponent itself, 
which is not including the sign. So those are the, 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 the pieces. And also you have the sign of the whole thing. So I'm going to put it here. Okay. So these are the individual components. Once you parse the number correctly, you end up with all of these components. Some of these may be zero, but you know you have to you know, figure out you know, by looking at the actual string. So now the question is, how do you look at these things and come up with the value that it is representing and without using any floating point numbers in the process? Is that making any sense? Okay. So I'm going to help you out a little bit here. <laughs> the actual value is going to be the first digit, first decimal digit, plus uh, the quantity. I'm going to use a QDP here to represent this number. Okay, so plus QDP uh, divided by um, ten to the power of number of digit quantity. Um, so num digit QDP, right? I'll, I'll give you an exact example. Okay, Can fine. Change that to Q, DQP to QDP. QDP, sorry, QDP like that. And then you also have to put a parentheses around this and say this is times power uh, ten to the power of decimal. Uh, Depending on whether the sign is positive or negative, you have to either divide it or multiply it. But this is the basic idea, okay? Power 10, and then you have um, essentially, you know, decimal exponent. Okay. But it can be positive or negative. Yep. Is num digit the location number? No, it's the number of digits you know, for that component. That's what um, parse the dig parse oh, deck okay. is returning. Yeah, because that is useful. Because otherwise, 0.7, 1.7 will be interpreted the same way as 1.07, and it's going to be the same as 1.007. That's why you, we have to keep track of number of digits uh, used to represent a number. Okay. So this is the general form, and you have to kind of play with this to you know convert it into this particular format. Now, one way to do this is to break up your program into many, many you know, individual cases. Okay, that's one way to do it. Um, and you know, other ways to do it is to try to generalize and use one single, you know, flow to deal with it. But I would say the first thing you have to do is to break it up into these components first. If you can do this by Thursday, I think you're on track. Because you know it won't take you that much time for the other part to get it done. Okay. It sounds really bad. Okay. It sounds really bad because we do not have the power function, but without even without the power function, we have these numbers, right? So you can basically let these numbers cancel out as much as you want to first, and then deal with whatever is remaining. Okay or not? I would do the parsing first. Okay, so deal with the parsing for it first, and get all of these components. Once we get all these components, then we can work on the actual conversion. Are there any questions about the general approach? No. Yep. Go ahead. I think if you can finish this part and break it up into component by Thursday, then on in the on Thursday during the lab time, you know, I will give you some additional ideas of how to take all of these components and you know kind of structure your code to convert everything into a format that's look that that that's more like that. And once you can convert it into a format like that, then it becomes just a problem of how do we stick in the, these bits over here and those bits over there? And that's just you know bitwise you know sh bit shifting, 
and bitwise OR operations. Okay, so your focus right now is parsing. Okay, break it down into the individual components first. Once we have the individual components, then we can move forward and do the conversion. Are there any questions about the process? Then you guys might have enough to go forward with. With the parsing part, just the parsing part. Just break it up into individual components in base 10. And I authorize the use of any code that I develop today. <laughs> so you can use a uh, parse deck and also the other one which is what power two. Okay. Power two you don't need it right away, okay, but the other one you do want to get it done. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. So as I said, you know, if you can get the parsing done by Thursday, okay, on Thursday, you know, during the lab time, I can make the assumption that you have that you have done the parsing part, and then we'll go ahead and talk about you know how do we do the actual conversion and figure out the exponent in base two, and also you know the mantissa in base two, um, and so on. Can you throw a number? So, so can you give us any number so we can? All the numbers that we talked about earlier today mm -hmm. on the whiteboard, um, those would be good test cases. Cool. And I can give you some extra ones here. Yeah, you know, so this is going to be recorded because that is not. Um, so one is definitely you know one of those. Plus one, negative one. One point two three. Um, negative one point two three. You know, which is not a big deal. Um, one point two point three to um, times ten to the power of two. Uh, 2.3 times 10 to the power of negative 2, okay, negative 2.3 to the power of 2, you know, so all of these would be like, you know, good cases to test because, you know, um, you might want to throw in something a little bit more tricky, like 2.003 times 10 to the power of negative 2, just to make sure that you can, your code can differentiate 2.3 as opposed to 2.003. So I think these would be good ones to test. You know, you just have to chop it up into individual components. Keep track of everything. Don't lose any information in the process. Okay. And the other thing is, you want to make assumptions. If you do not specify the exponent, it is defa by default a zero. Okay. If I do not specify uh, this portion, it is by default a zero. Okay. So all of those, you know, would be useful as well. So is that enough to for you guys to go forward? Okay. And we still have about half an hour in the lab. So if you want to get started, at least you'll know, type in, you know, power to and uh, parse deck. You know that would be that would be great. I can show the code here, and you guys can copy it because I really don't want to give you the code. <laughs> it's not long. It, it's it's really kind of short, and by typing it, I'm hoping that you guys would kind of think about it. Oh, okay, so that's what it's doing, and so on. All right. So without any other questions, I'm going to stop the structured part of